astronaut costume on, Mr. Lyman. <laughs> Always have to tease you. Okay. Hey, who do we have here? Mr. Gonzalez, you're up. Yes, good morning, Your Honors. Uh, Michael Gonzalez for the appellant. May it please the court, I'm going to um, reserve five minutes for, for rebuttal. <clears throat> the lower court um, made errors in its order granting partial summary judgment in the following manners. In paragraph one of its order, it states that as a result of the, as a result, the funds were immediately credited to the account and available for use. And this is referring to the wired funds that came into Lion Shares account. So that's a critical, critical finding that it was an errant finding, but it was critical because that finding started the cascade of factual and legal errors that emanated in this in this judgment. Um, relatedly, paragraph six of the order states that the wire transfer was cleared, uh, cleared PNC's automated system. As a result, the funds were already available um, and the email shows nothing more than a routine bank customer service. The funds were not available to Mr. Cheatham and or lion share on November 30th of 2015, November 30th of 2015. The point of departure of my civil conspiracy of the civil conspiracy claim is December 1 through December 4. By the court utilizing that foundational finding, that is what the domino effect that created the domino effect, which created the legal error. <clears throat> Mr. Gonzalez, yes. what, what would you articulate was the unlawful agreement at the heart of the conspiracy? The fraudulent, well, the scheme, uh, Judge Yocum, the scheme was to change the beneficiary name from Incognitus to Lion Share, uh, Lion Share Group of South Florida. So that, so was, would... that was the scheme. And the, the tortious conduct was the fraudulent conversion of McManus's funds to the Lion Share Group of South Florida. Okay, so you're, you're saying that Grant and Cheatham conspired to fraudulently change the name on the funds to make them available to lion share. That's yes. how you define the scheme. That's correct. And that was the scheme. Okay. And so the summary judgment evidence that there was of the scheme was um, the fact that Grant basically agreed to make the funds available, right? And based at, it seems based on this sort of dubious seeming letter that um, Cheatham managed to get sent to PNC, correct? Correct. Not, and, and Judge Yoko, not just got sent to PNC, what procedurally occurred was <clears throat> November 30th, the funds go into this account. They're in Cheatham's account. However, the beneficiary is Incognitus LLC, who was supposed, who was actually McManus's desired beneficiary. On December 1, hence the start of the conspiracy, on December 1 of 2015, the Detective Recovery Unit lets Grant know because Grant tried to Grant tried to do an outgoing wire of $250,000 at Cheatham's behest. And the detective recovery unit, namely Corey Humphrey with their unit, sent an email, which is all record evidence, saying, no, we're, we're, halt, we're not allowing this outgoing wire to occur because we're still investigating the incoming wire. Which then prompted Grant to need information, letters, something to, sub to substantiate the notion that, well, this wire is not actually for Incognitus LLC, it's actually for Lion Share Group of South Florida. So Grant said, give me something that will justify what you're asking me to do. That's correct. And this, so, this is, is there, was there any evidence, any of anything in the record suggesting a pre-existing uh, less than arm's length relationship 
between Grant and Cheatham. Anything suggesting that, or is this is this just a you know as, as PNC characterizes it an arm's length customer service uh, relationship? Well, Judge I, I I I dispute that this is just a normal relationship because I submit that a normal relationship is not trying to get additional information, uh, which namely a, a clearly fraudulent letter to change a beneficiary of a $350,000 wire. I don't think that that is routine um, a banking relationship, especially in light of the fact that we do have the, de the detective recovery unit putting the spotlight on this on these funds. It was in concert with with uh, with Cheatham and Grant that and then the overt act where Grant actually made that two hundred and fifty thousand dollar outgoing wire, which completely exhausted all of the all of the funds. Mr. Gonzalez, if I may, because I guess the trouble that I have, you keep using the term fraudulent, fraudulent. Isn't this some this appears to be maybe a negligence or somebody not doing something but fraudulent and conspiring and scheming that's pretty that's a pretty high burden so what evidence other than i know judge ross and Newcomb was asking you about anything in the record which would support that fraudulent that scheme right as opposed I, to just a mistake that right. happened i i appreciate i appreciate the question the the, the case law suggests that a conspirator need not take part in the planning, inception, or successful conclusion of a conspiracy. The conspirator need only know of the scheme and assist it in some way to be held responsible for all the acts of the co-conspirators. That's D'Onofrio and also the Logan versus Morgan Lewis second DCA cases. So it's not necessarily we, the, the co-conspirator has to have this mensa of some horrific act that's going to be done. If he knows of the scheme, which clearly he knew of the scheme by virtue of Cheatham's um, affidavit, where Cheatham was told by Grant, we need to, you know, we need information to change the beneficiary. But, but, but if I may, Mr. Gonzalez, it's knowledge of the fraudulent scheme. That's the critical issue. In order to be a conspirator, you have to know that whatever it is, it's going to be fraud and there's going to be a conspiracy to defraud that's the part it's not like oh okay it has to go from this point to that point oops there's somebody else's name but the actual fraud itself the fraudulent scheme is what i'm getting right. at and judge Kazam, if you if the court looks at the that letter that was utilized by grant to to turn that de beneficiary name to allow those funds to be used by 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 uh by cheetah and or lion share if you look at that letter Someone cannot have willful ignorance. That letter I submit to you reeked of fraud. And for someone to not only did it reek with fraud at the at the you could just look at the letter. I mean, we, we don't need to be a banking executive to 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 really see the um the impropriety of that letter vis-a-vis -vis trying to convert a, a beneficiary of a wire, but in, especially in light of the fact that the, det the detective recovery unit stopped the initial outgoing wire because there that that provided Mr. Grant notice that there's some a, an issue with this. And then Grant uses that letter to allow for the beneficiary change. And it, it, there's there's case law that we've cited in our in our brief. I don't know if it was in our reply or in our in our um, in our initial brief. There's the notion of willful ignorance, and someone just can't say, "Well, I didn't know," and be ex absolved of of any behavior. If we look at that letter, then the question becomes coupled with the fact that the, de the detective recovery unit also put up a red flag. Then we have to look at what did Mr. Grant do and why? Mr. Grant testified in his deposition that he wanted to placate his client. He wanted, I believe the, the, uh, the wording was he wanted to 
do the service that was requested of, 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 of Mr. Cheatham. But there comes a time when you have to you have to look at why was it done and what was the basis of changing that beneficiary name. And if the basis of changing that beneficiary name was that letter, then clearly I think the notion of willful ignorance comes up here where Mr. Grant cannot just say, I didn't know. And, you know, he gave me the letter. So this suffices. So we have his knowledge of the scheme by virtue of his email, his December 4th email to Mr. Grant. That perfectly encapsulates what Mr. Grant knew, what he wanted done. And in fact, the overt act that was done was he did the actual $250,000 outgoing wire. So I'm not suggesting that Mr. Grant knew of this nefarious scheme from day one. He doesn't have to know. The law does not make require him to know of this nefarious scheme. All the law requires is of him to know of the scheme and to be a participant in it. Clearly, he knew what, what, what needed to be done or what was desired to be done. And clearly, he, there were overt acts to complete that. There's no dispute as to my client being damaged. So in, as far as the elements that were provided um, to the court, the, <clears throat> the scheme, as I mentioned, was to benefit, to change the beneficiary from incognitus to lion's share. Um, we know that Grant knew of that by virtue of Mr. Cheatham's affidavit, paragraphs eight and nine of Mr. Cheatham's affidavit. We also know that November 30th, and this is the factual finding that I, that, I, that, I, that I referenced earlier that started a domino effect of factual and legal error, is that the point of departure of the conspiracy was December 1 through December 4, where Cheatham and Grant are doing these things to effectuate that beneficiary change. Um, In the deposition of Mr. Grant, he was just, asked- Mr. Gunn, oh. can I just clarify one thing? Yes. The beneficiary change in itself is not unlawful, correct? What makes it unlawful is that it's done with an, you know, allegedly done with an intent to defraud? I mean, it was a fraudulent conversion, correct. In this situation, if, if in fact everything was up and up and it wasn't an error that the, 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 uh, the beneficiary is supposed to be some something else or someone else and proper documentation was provided to show that yes this is a legitimate error then no harm no foul in in other words if if i go into my account and there's a two hundred thousand dollars into the in the account that i have no I, I know it's not for me and then i provide paperwork to a bank representative which arguably it, it reeks of fraud and that bank representative then allows me to use that two hundred thousand dollars or access it there's the wrong and i believe that the wrong would be the fraudulent conversion As far as the intent of Mr. Grant, there's record evidence in his deposition that he did not want that wire to be returned. So here he knows that it probably should be returned, but he did not want it returned. Question, in, and this is found in record uh, page 2442. And you didn't want the wire to be returned, correct? It's not my, that's not my characterization, characterization of what my intent was with the transaction. Question, what was the risk? Answer, that the wire would be returned. <clears throat> In other words, it would not be accessible or utilized by Cheatham. And I question him, why was that a problem? Be 
Answer, because the client wanted the wire to come into the account. Question, and you wanted to facilitate that for Mr. Cheatham, correct? Answer, yes, he is my client and I wanted to provide the service request he gave me. So here he, we have him acting in concert with Mr. Cheatham. Also in the record, there was evidence from Mr. Humphrey that Cheatham was someone that was not a trustworthy individual um, that we cited in our, in our appellate brief concerning Mr. based on Mr. Cheatham's transactional history with, uh, with PNC Bank. There were three transactions. One of them was a bounce check. And then we have this huge $350,000 wire coming in. And then Mr. Cheatham trying to quickly uh, send the outgoing wires. So Mr. Humphrey with the Detective Recovery Unit also testified that Mr. Cheatham was not trustworthy. So here we have Mr. Grant dealing with an untrustworthy person coupled with the fraudulent letter. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it, it defies credulity that Mr. Grant did not know that something was amiss, was remiss here. Okay, hey, Mr. Gonzalez, you are into your rebuttal time. Thank you. Thank you. Are you are you done? <laughs> yeah, and for that for those reasons, I'm sorry, Your Honors, for that for those reasons, uh, reversal is judicially and factually warranted, and I would refer the the, the court back to my appellate uh, brief as well as my reply. Sure. Okay, Mr. Lyman, you're up. Good morning, Your Honors, and may it please the court. Chance Lyman here on behalf of PNC. And, um, you know, I'll start by saying, Judge Rothstein, you can, I think you have accurately characterized that this is nothing in the record shows anything more than an arm's length client customer relationship at a bank. It's a wire transfer. It's a branch manager talking to a bank client about a wire transfer. That's that's what's in the record. And Judge Kazam, I think your point is, is correct too. At, at most, You've got mistakes that were made, and as you said, you know maybe some negligence on the bank's part. Nothing shows fraud, and and I think the law requires evidence of knowledge of fraud at some point. And and I don't think uh, Ms. McManus has ever really identified, you know, when that sort of knowledge was imputed to PNC. Like at what point did PNC have knowledge of actual fraud? And that's what they need under the law. And we're not talking about PNC being involved in the initial planning, but at some point they've got to know about the fraud and then commit an act, you know, in furtherance of the fraud. And there's nothing like that in the record. Um, and I'll just go in reverse order here in some of the comments. You know, the, the deposition testimony from Mr. Grant that was just read, again, nothing but a customer service interaction. The transaction history. <clears throat> Mr. Humphrey did describe the transaction history and he used the word trustworthy, but he, he, he doesn't actually remember anybody ever reviewing this transaction history as part of the, you know, clearing the funds um, timeline. So the transact there's there's no knowledge of anybody knowing the transaction history and therefore having knowledge of that irregularity. Uh, so despite the fact that Mr. Humphrey observed that it might have shown a not trustworthy customer, that's not actually evidence uh, for summary judgment purposes of, of a fraudulent um, conspiracy. Uh, the notion of willful ignorance, uh, that, that comes from criminal case law. Uh, I don't think it, uh, there's any case cited that that's uh, applied in the civil context. Even if there were, that was raised for the first time in the reply brief, and it certainly wasn't argued to the trial court. So it's not preserved. Um, the, uh, the Cheatham affidavit doesn't say anything about an agreement between Mr. Grant and Mr. Cheatham to commit fraud. That, that there's not evidence of fraud there. Um, you know, that, that I'll just direct the court back to the complaint because I think the complaint really, really solves everything. Paragraph 16 is essentially the only allegation about what PNC did in terms of this whole interaction. And it says, rather than affirmatively address the irregularities of the incoming wire that could or would have revealed the fraud that was being committed upon the plaintiffs, PNC took a non-cautionary and cooperative course of action to clear and allow the remainder of the funds to be unfrozen. That, that's, 
that's an allegation that PNC did not know about the fraud, Your Honors, because apparently if they had taken other courses of action, it would or could have revealed the fraud. So I think plaintiff's own complaint reveals that there was no evidence of fraud uh, on PNC's part. And, you know, with that, if there are no other questions from the panel, I'll, I'll uh, rest with that. I think we got nothing, Mr. Lyman. Mr. Gonzalez? Yes. Thank you, Your Honor, Your Honor I'm, I would just refer the court back to the D'Onofrio and the Logan versus Morgan Lewis um, holding where a conspiracy need not take part in the planning, inception, or successful conclusion of a conspiracy. The conspirator, the conspirator need only know of the scheme and assist it in some way to be held responsible for all the acts of his co-conspirators. Well, I think, you know, Mr. Gonzalez, and actually, I was on that case. I was lawyer for the appellant in that case. No frio. We called it Donna Frio. And uh, yeah, but you have to you have to know about the scheme. And uh, uh, I, I don't see that here. You know, you, what they what they know about is they have a customer who has a, a problem that they're trying to solve. But they don't know that there is a scheme to defraud. Judge Northcutt, North, I don't believe that that I believe circumstantial evidence can be submitted to uh, to a court or to a jury concerning the knowledge part. We we knew that Mr. Grant wanted the beneficiary to be changed, coupled with his desire to do that and that fraudulent letter that was utilized to do that. I believe that there is sufficient circumstantial evidence that he knew of the scheme. Um, like I said, he doesn't have to be at the planning stage, you know, but he just has to be a participant in a scheme, which I believe this is a civil conspiracy. Obviously. But you can't, you can't be an accidental participant in a scheme and be part of the conspiracy, correct? I agree with you. Okay. You cannot be an accidental. However, Mr. Grant's actions cannot, I submit to the court, cannot be considered accidental in that he took an active role in effectuating this beneficiary change. And in fact, the, the ultimate overt act was sending the outgoing $250,000 wire, allowing Mr. Cheatham to have access to the $250,000 and then actually doing the outgoing wire. So there's clearly the, the overt act. Um, and I submit to the court that there's more than ample circumstantial evidence of knowledge of the scheme. He may not know of the, the specifics of the scheme. I'll, I'll give the court that. He may not know the specifics of the scheme. But like I said, the scheme was to change the beneficiary name from, in, from incognitus to lion share. There's no requirement that a co-conspirator know, a civil co-conspirator know of the nefarious nature of the scheme. But it was a scheme. And with that, I will leave the court um, and reassert my, my position that the matter should be reversed. Thank you very much, Mr. Gonzalez. Same to you, Mr. Lyman. You guys want to leave our virtual courtroom by clicking the leave button on your Zoom screen and you'll disappear and we'll call the next case. Thank you, Your Honors. Sure thing. The next case is Wilmington Savings Wilmington Savings Fund.